The X-Men are one of Marvel's most famous teams, and a lot of that has to do with the Fox movies that we got over the course of 20 years. Some of them were great, some of them were not so great, but they all lived in the hearts of superhero fans around the world. However, we nearly didn't get any of these movies, as in the mid-90s, we could have gotten a completely different version of the X-Men based off a script penned by Andrew Kevin Walker. So, what if it happened? James Cameron ultimately decided to exit production on the X-Men in 1989, Caracol Pictures were still set to be involved without him on the film's development. However, that all came to an end when Caracol started going through some financial difficulties in 1992, and Marvel decided to pull out of the deal. However, they would not give up, and they would shop the X-Men around to different movie studios. Marvel would attempt to pitch an X-Men movie to Columbia in December of 1992, but they were just sadly not interested. It was starting to seem as though the chances for an X-Men movie were as good as dead. That is, until a couple years later, when 20th Century Fox suddenly became very interested. That was due to the surprising success of X-Men the Animated Series, which was airing on Fox Kids. With the interest in the X-Men now at an all-time high, Lauren Schuler Donner, wife of famous Superman director Richard Donner, would buy the rights on Fox's behalf in 1994. She had experience working on action movies by this point already, such as on Lady Hawk. She was quick to begin production on the X-Men, and would hire Andrew Kevin Walker to pen a film treatment. Walker by this point had only worked on a few films, but is now very famous for his work on David Fincher 7. Now in this version, mutants have already been around for quite a long time, and there's been a lot of political unrest over what should be quote unquote done with them. In the end, the Mutant Registration Act is passed, which will require mutants to come forward and publicly identify themselves whether they like it or not. The act was brought forward by two well-documented mutant haters, Bolivar Trask and Henry Peter Gyrich. A deadline has been officially set, and all mutants are expected to register by August 4th. The military has even been going around forcefully identifying mutants. However, this obviously doesn't exactly sit well with most mutants, in particular, the Brotherhood of Mutants. This team consists of the leader Magneto, as well as Toad, Sabretooth, and the Blob, but they later increase their numbers by successfully rescuing a mutant named Juggernaut. They all make a statement by destroying the Citicorp building in New York City. However, this is only turning humanity even further against mutants. Meanwhile, we learn of a mutant named Charles Xavier, who runs a secret school for mutant children, and regularly comes to blows with Magneto over their differing ideologies. The pair used to be the best of friends when they were younger, but they had a falling out, something that Xavier has been keeping hidden away from the other X-Men. The rest of the team, by the way, would have included Jean Grey, Cyclops, Beast, Angel, and Iceman, and they would all train on using their powers safely in the Danger Room. We'd also see a subplot involving a young Jubilee. She discovers her mutant powers, an issue that her parents are very divided about. Feeling unsure about what will happen to her, she decides to run away from home and gets taken in by the X-Men. Meanwhile, Xavier learns of Magneto's plan to force regular humans out of the city of Manhattan and turn it into a mutant-exclusive state, Escape from New York style. Xavier ultimately decides to recruit a new member for their team, Wolverine, who is suffering from amnesia. They find him working as an aimless special ops soldier at the Canadian government facility Department H. However, he initially refuses to join the X-Men, and he instead goes off soul-searching. However, he ends up getting involved in a fight with Sabretooth, which helps to trigger some flashbacks, and it makes him rethink his plan so he ends up joining the X-Men after all, and on the X-Men, he would have some romantic tension with Jean Grey, despite her already being in a relationship with Cyclops, which causes a bit of a rivalry to form between them. Also, on a side note, Charles is actually trying to groom Cyclops to be his successor, but he doesn't think he can do it. In fact, at one point, Wolverine tries to take control of the team, and some of them want Cyclops to lead, so they cast a vote, which Cyclops wins in the end, but we later learn that Cyclops actually voted for Wolverine because he doesn't feel like he'd be a good leader at all. 
Magneto, by the way, would be well aware of the X-Men planning to make a move against him, and would out their location to Trask and Guyrich, who capture Beast. They then implant him unknowingly with a tracking device, and the pair dispatch Sentinels to the X-Mansion. Meanwhile, while the X-Men and the government are distracted fighting each other, Magneto would seize control of Manhattan Island. The X-Men, meanwhile, thanks to an unlikely team-up from Wolverine and Cyclops, are able to destroy the Sentinels, and the whole team heads over to Manhattan to engage in an epic final battle with the Brotherhood, who are ultimately destroyed defeated and sent to prison, except for Sabretooth, though, who escapes. The movie would then end with Wolverine, deciding to go away for a while in search of answers about his past. However, sadly, despite being looked upon favorably by studio executives, Walker's script was ultimately rejected for just being too expensive and having too many characters in it at once. The support just wasn't there, and Walker's X-Men in the end was cancelled. So I'm going to talk about the things I don't like about this before I talk about the good things. I like to end things on a good note. And thankfully, there aren't too many bad things about this one. Uh, I only really have two issues with this one. First of all, I don't think that Bolivar, Trask, and, and Guy Rich, I don't, I don't think they should have been in it. I think that this movie already sounds like it has enough going on. And the stuff with them and the Sentinels and, you know, I, I just think it's a little too much. You know what I mean? I think that the, you know, the X movies we got had the right idea by saving all the mutant registration stuff for the third movie, although they, they didn't handle it right. But I do think they had the right idea by saving it. I don't think that's the story that they should do in the first X-Men. I think it was smarter than to save it. Uh, not that they can't do it in the first one, don't get me wrong, but I think it works better if we've built up, you know, the team and we've built up mutant kind in general. So we, you know, kind of just hate it a little bit more. You know what I mean? Not that we wouldn't hate it already, but it would, I think it would just be, you know, even worse if we felt so connected to these characters characters, you know what I mean? Uh, and my other issue with it is that there are some characters in this, or I should say not in this script that should be, uh, characters like Rogue. Like, Rogue is not gonna, Rogue would not have been in this movie. And that just, mmm, that doesn't sit well with me. And Kitty Pride wouldn't have been in it either, which is weird. Uh, Colossus wouldn't have been in it. Uh, Mystique wouldn't have been in it. Nightcrawler, no. Uh, lots of characters I think definitely should have been in it. Emma Frost, I mean, seriously, the Hellfire Club, not even men mentioned. Uh, so many things I definitely think should have been in this that weren't. Uh, maybe they would have been saved for the sequels. I don't know, because people didn't really complain about, you know, Nightcrawler not being in the first X-Men movie that we got. Uh, and they saved him for X-Men 2, and he ended up being worth the wait. So, I don't know. I could just be nitpicking. But, you know, there's just some characters I think need to be there from the start. Characters like Rogue, I think, should be there from day one. That's just my opinion. And, and you're fine to disagree with that. I completely understand if you disagree but I think that Rogue should have been in this, and if you're going to do Rogue, you should probably do Gambit too. You know, if you're going to do Adult Rogue, that is, because they didn't do that in the actual movies, as you all know. Um, and I didn't hate the direction that went with Rogue in the actual movies, although I, I don't really understand why it had to be Rogue. Like, I feel like they could have done it with somebody else. Like, they could have done it with Kitty Pride or Jubilee, you know what I mean? Uh, and speaking of Jubilee, I'm very happy that she's in this version, because I know, it, I know a lot of people were annoyed that she wasn't in the actual movie movies and i'm definitely up there like she really okay like she had a cameo in a couple of the movies if i remember correctly but she didn't really become a prominent character until apocalypse and even then a lot of her scenes ended up being left on the cutting room floor uh so you know jubilee man she really deserves a lot better than she's gotten in the movies and i'm really hoping that the mcu starts with her like i think that would be cool to like start off with the younger x-men characters and then like show them all coming together uh in in the gifted school for or the school for gifted youngsters. I don't know. I just think that'd be a really cool way to do it. Uh, that's that's just my take on that. If you're wondering, but yeah, I'm just so happy that Jubilee has such a prominent role in this version. Um, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, the way they write in the script, I don't care as much about her story as I did about Rogues in the actual movie. But I mean, I I don't know if that's necessarily because of her situation or if that's just because her powers aren't as dangerous as Rogues, debatably. Because uh, Rogue literally can't touch people. You know what I mean? It's it's an inherently sad power to have, if that makes sense. At least in my opinion. Um, but yeah, so I mean, apart from some key characters not being there and some other characters that probably shouldn't have been there, you know, like the like Bolivar Trask and, uh, and Guy Rich, I think this sounds great. I think Magneto's plan sounds like something he would do, and it sounds like an awesome plan, honestly.
honestly. Uh, I think it's got a lot of great characters involved. Uh, it's got Department H, which I think sounds really goddamn badass, honestly, uh, to do Wolverine like that, uh, instead of just having him be like a biker in Canada like they did in the actual movie. I think this sounds a little bit cooler than that. Um, and I think that they write Cyclops and Wolverine's rivalry better in this version. Uh, and yeah, there's just there's a lot of things about this I like a lot more than in the one we got. And that's not to say I'm unhappy with the one we got, for the record. I love the Brian Singer X-Men movies. I don't love Brian Singer, but I like his movies. Um, so, uh, except for Apocalypse, that one was was bad. But um, the first two X-Men movies in Days of Future Past are all really, really good movies, in my opinion. And I'm more than happy with them. But this actually sounds like it might have been an even better way to start off the X-Men movies. It really could have. And I think that it could have put Marvel on the map way before uh, they actually finally did get on the map. Because this movie would have, you know, come out before the first Blade. Uh, it would have come out long before the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man. So this movie could have helped Marvel uh, beat it with beating DC, because the Batman movies would have still been going on by that point. This movie probably would have come out like a year before Batman and Robin and maybe that would have convinced Warner Brothers to change Batman and Robin as it was being made and make it better maybe I don't know um maybe the movie like this would give them the kick in the ass they sorely needed in the 90s I don't know um but yeah this version sounds a, like really good I'm not gonna say a lot better but possibly a lot better anyway um yeah so I just love this script but let me know in the comments down below what you guys think of this version uh and also if if you enjoyed this video, make sure to please give it a thumbs up and share it with all of your friends on all your various social media platforms. And speaking of social media, don't forget to follow me on Instagram, Rinsler underscore productions, and I'll see all of you in the next video.